So thanks, Jeanette, for that extremely kind introduction, and I'll just do a bit of further introduction for Phil as well. Welcome. I believe that there is also translation services available for those that are not used to a Scottish accent from myself and Jeanette. Don't worry, you're safe with Phil. <laughs> so let's talk about the future of health. Who's excited about that? Do we think some good stuff might be happening? Yep. Some bad stuff might be happening? What are the challenges we face? We don't really like to volunteer any health challenges that we face at present or what's important to us. Climate. Climate, exactly. Picking up on the slide there. Money. The elderly. The elderly. Activity, physical activity. Yeah. So there's all sorts of things to consider. And again, you know, this is what's important to me at present. And these are the questions I've got, I suppose. You know, what is the future of health? We can look back at the past. We can see where things are at, at present. But what is actually in front of us? Will our children be happy? These are my three at present. And will they live to 100? They might do. It sort of depends. But before I had my three kids, I was footloose and fancy free. I used to spend a fair bit of time climbing and a fair bit of time running. I used to climb all over the world and used to race at the North Pole, Antarctica, the jungles of Indonesia, the Sahara Desert, out to Mongolia, stuff like that as well. And I very well remember being somewhere north of Aberdeen, which is where I was from, somewhere even colder, the North Pole, and uh, rocking up at the start line and saying to the race director, Richard, uh, I can't help noticing that, you know, there's obviously, you know, a bit of danger of polar bears and stuff like that, you know, what should we do about that? And he said, oh, you know, don't worry about that. You know, if any polar bears show up, they haven't actually entered, so they'll be disqualified. <laughs> but essentially, what Jeanette mentioned was at one point in time, I ran from John O'Groats to the Sahara Desert, and it was a fair bit of time to run. It's 4,300 kilometers, running 35 miles every day. And there was five or six hours of the day that I'd run, but there's also a fair bit of time to think and consider where we are from a health perspective and also consider the future of health. And I worked it out, you know, that unfortunately we haven't solved it. This is the current state of play, okay? So we've got stats from 1990, 2000, 2010. <laughs> we haven't got the ones from 2020, but I don't believe they'll be promising. But is that important? So, you know, death is an unsolved problem. But there have been absolutely massive leaps in terms of health. This is the true age of acceleration. Can anyone guess what average life expectancy was 200 years ago? 42. Yeah, you know, even less. So worldwide, in the UK, it was about 42. In the UK and the Netherlands, we led the world at that time in terms of human life expectancy. Some of us from Glasgow and our life expectancy might still be 42. <laughs> but... Worldwide, life expectancy was somewhere between 20 and 30. You're doing pretty well if you made it to 30. I'm 39 now, so that wasn't great. So things are changing at a greater pace and scale than ever before. You know, the futurist Mark Stevenson talks about the age of acceleration. Some amazing achievements in terms of putting a man on the moon, you know, winning the Ryder Cup, important stuff like that. But, you know, is anything more important than the life expectancy almost tripling in the last 200 years? And some of that has come about, you know, with the Industrial Revolution, this guy here, does anyone know who any of these people are? The clue might be the cow. Yeah, so, you know, cures for smallpox, cowpox, Florence Nightingale, bringing stuff in to do with sanitation, to do with medical statistics. Um, and in terms of this, what does this look like? Yeah, absolutely. You know, so x-rays, so medical imaging coming about and actually just changing the way they do things. It wasn't just about asking questions in the exam anymore. We had further tools that could actually aid our medical decision making. And you can see this gentleman's got a beard. I'm actually doing Movember, so I'm told it certainly improves uh, your ability to fight bears and <laughs> other important matters such as that, having a beard. But here are some of the good things that are happening right now. You know, extreme poverty is decreasing significantly. Child mortality, youth literacy, human life expectancy, things continue to trend in the correct direction. So there's all sorts of stuff to be excited about. And you can see this is where we're now. Things are continuing to improve. Things are continuing to get better, despite all the news that we might see in the BBC and the Guardian. 
it's amazing how little good news actually gets out there in terms of you know, health, to do with medical imaging, and some of the exciting advances that are there. And we talk about the age of acceleration. You know, I'm 39 years old. Look at this new stuff. None of this stuff was about at the time that I was born. It's all here now. Just think about what the future of health and the future of technology might look like. Is it not amazing? So we talked about some of the major health drivers, some of the challenges that we face. And we talked about, you know, some of the things that can affect human health, non-communicable diseases. It used to be that, you know, 14,000 years ago when people first inhabited Scotland, a bit earlier in the UK, the main cause of death might have been due to, you know, exposure, it might be due to infectious diseases, but nowadays it's all about type 2 diabetes, heart attacks, strokes, form of cancer, non-communicable diseases. These are the things that are causing the biggest issue. And again, it's a, tru it's a truly a global learning opportunity now. It's not just that you know, all of the good ideas are coming from Europe or North America and stuff like that. Many innovations, many new stuff, many technologies, many medical imaging stuff that's happening truly globally. But there are difficulties in terms of the financial situation at the NHS. There are difficulties that any form of healthcare system worldwide face. But here are some of the things and here are some of the certainties. We know that you know, the world is getting smaller and we can learn from our colleagues all over the world. And it's fantastic this has been web streamed. You know? So if there are any questions or if there are any you know, observations that people have got in the other side of the world or wherever this is being streamed to, then it would be good to chat about that. But you can see again, you know, people are also finding ways to think about their own physical health, but also their mental health and well-being. This is certainly you know, a major health trend and it's certain to become even more important. Medical technology. We think about what we have now and compare it. When I used to work out in Kenya or in outer Mongolia and places like that, you know, our ability to get things right for our patients was different because we have got you know, blood tests, we've got x-ray, we've got ultrasound, we've got MRI and things like that and modalities that just allow us to be clearer in our diagnosis and can then uh, ensure we get better results for our patients. And technology can help. You know, the way we can communicate, the things we can do, we can look up. Just because it's in Google, it might still be true. <laughs> but again, things are changing and a lot of you know, patients are much more involved in their own healthcare and are coming up with ideas. And again, you know, it's, it's not really doctors' jobs to tell people what to do. It's to give people information and to help make medical decisions together. And that's pretty much what we do across sport. I work for European Athletics. I work for Scottish Rugby. But one of my main jobs is working for the European Tour as their chief medical officer. And the key thing really is teamwork. Because if you think about you know, the BMW PGA, if you think about the Ryder Cup, if you think about the Open Championship, these guys are looking for answers instantly. They're looking to have experts like you know, Phil Robinson or Phil O'Connor there to try and work out what's going on straight away. You know, so again, it's not available all of the time to everybody, but a premium service can be there in terms of having a sports medicine doctor, having a radiologist, having an ultrasound machine, access to MRI can be quite quick and stuff like that. And again, it's about giving people answers in a really timely fashion, but also working as a team. So working out what the patient or the, what the player thinks, speaking to the radiologist, speaking to the sports medicine doctor, and just arriving at a conclusion together. And that's really it. You know, it's shared decision making. It's working with patients and it's working with people to get from A to B. So again, I mean, if you think about, you know, major health certainties, a lot of it does revolve around working with people listening to people internationally and also taking advantage of the technologies that are now there. And Phil is obviously the subject area expert in terms of radiology, so he'll discuss the future of imaging a bit more. So what are the easy wins for top health and performance? Who wants to live to 100? Nah, no hands there. Who wants to be happy? Who wants to be healthy? Probably that as well. So here are some things that can help, you know, get active and stay active, get some decent sleep. I've got three kids under five. I'm going to sleep tremendously well in the sleeper tonight. But did you know that if you go from sleeping five hours a night to eight hours per night, you're four times less likely to get the common cold. You're an incredible stat and you're much more likely to be productive at work as well. So eat and drink well, take breaks, take holidays and work as teams. I think, you know, these are things that are very protective and the human body loves a sense of purpose. Now again, who wants the bad news? I'll talk briefly about physical inactivity because this is stuff that I worked on for the Scottish Government and continue to do so. Does anyone want some bad news? 
Some folk do. Well, the bad news is that if you go from being a couch potato to a regular exerciser, and that can just be doing 30 minutes of walking five times per week or equivalent, or it can be making sure you're taking the stairs rather than the lifts and things such as that, you are more likely by 30 or 40% to get athlete's foot. <laughs> but again, being from Aberdeen, we do like a bargain. So you can see that although you might get blisters, you might get athlete's foot, your chance of early death is decreased by 30%. It didn't seem anyone was fussed by that, but people are keen to avoid heart attacks, strokes, type 2 diabetes, misery, depression, dementia, and better function. So essentially, it's something that we all know is important. It's important for our children, but I think it was the great uh, philosopher Kylie Minogue that said, you know, you're never too late, you've still got time. So it's something that can be a huge advantage to us right across the life course. So again, this was stuff that happened, and I was considering when I was running to the Sahara Desert, here are some of the lessons that I took in terms of the future is bright. Despite all the negativity in the press, which was still prevalent at the time it was running, and is still here now, there's all sorts of good stuff that's happening in terms of medical uh, improvements, in terms of radiology, in terms of opportunities for collaboration. There's all sorts of difficulties I faced there in terms of getting overtaken by donkeys, ran headfirst into a road sign and broke my nose live on the BBC, slightly embarrassing, wasn't too pretty to start with. And you can see that we did end up with a few blisters as well. So again, you know, the future of health is bright. There's all sorts of interesting stuff that's happening in terms of imaging at present. I'm personally grateful to Phil and to our radiology team for all that they do for the European tour and all that they do in terms of looking after our professional athletes. You know, it's relevant for all members of the society, but it's just absolutely incredible what is achievable at present. So over to Phil. Thanks for your time. Thanks very much, Andrew. I'm going to try and do a bit of technology here. Let's have a look. There's me. And sorry that my accent isn't Scottish, um, but I'll do my best. And it doesn't want to go. Hold on. There we go. That's me. So mine's from Belfast, but then I had English and Welsh parents, so it's a bit of everything. So I have no declarations. As you've already heard, this is the International Day of Radiology and this year it's sports imaging. And we're going to look at the past about how it's developed in radiological terms. We're going to look at what we're doing at the present and then also look at the future and see what might happen. So uh, the British Society of Skeletal Radiologists is the specialist in, in, uh, interest group of the Royal College and it's where musculoskeletal radiology lives and most sports imaging radiologists are musculoskeletal radiologists. It was formed in 85 by Dr Dennis Stoker who was an eminent radiologist at the Royal Orthopaedic Hospital, had 14 members at that time who met twice a year and they used to discuss interesting cases and you can see from the title it's not musculoskeletal, it's skeletal. You can see from the symbol of the society and from Röntgen's discovery, all we could see, that's kind of a, a bit underplaying it, was, was the, were the bones. So all they could really discuss were bone cancer, arthritis and trauma, if there was a fracture. Um, uh, and that's a slight problem for sports imaging because the majority of injuries are soft tissue. Where are we today? Well, the BSSR is an educational charity. We have over 500 members. As I said, we're the specialist in interest group for this college. We advise government and other societies on musculoskeletal radiology if it's needed. We still have our two one-day meetings. We also have a large biennial refresher course. And we're really focused on research, education and training, both in medical students, but also in radiology trainees and continuing with consultants. So let's look at musculoskeletal radiology in the past. So all we had was the x-ray. So this is a femur, this is your thigh bone, and we can do an x-ray. And in this case, this is an athlete with a stress fracture in their femur. So because there's this bump uh, in the bone that you can see here, uh, caused by remodeling, we can see it. Uh, in the 1970s, we had CT scanning, which is another uh, radiation-dependent modality that allows us to see the bone in even better um, detail. But we don't know whether this uh, remodeling is 
years old. We don't know whether it's active. And that, again, is a problem for x-rays and CT. You can see that we can see some soft tissues, but we don't really get a lot of detail. So what we really needed was a modality that would let us look at the bones, look at the joints and cartilage, the ligaments, but also look at the muscles and let us look at it in any plane that we wanted. So our sort of Röntgen moment in uh, MSK radiology came for like another, a lot of areas in, in radiology was the development of magnetic resonance imaging. And so we suddenly had a technique that we could look at the skin, we could look at the muscles, we can look at the bones. And this is the same athlete that we saw with the x-rays. And you can see that uh, we've got that bump in the bone still, but around it on this sequence, which I'll explain in a moment, we can see the cell turnover that the bone is still trying to cope with the ongoing stress reaction. So we know this is actually a symptomatic ongoing stress reaction. And a few months later, we can then see that the bones remodeled and become quiescent. The other area that happened at the same time as this technological advance for us in musculoskeletal radiology was a vast improvement in ultrasound. And ultrasound, of course, has been around for years, and we all know in relation to pregnancy and to scanning your liver, and that's relatively low frequency. But the technology came along that allowed high frequency scanning, which allowed us to see muscles and tendons in really high detail. And MRI remains the mainstay, with MRI having a focal use in sports imaging. So really, we want to be able to look at a section like this. This is a section through somebody's thigh, with the thigh bone and muscles and fat. And we want something that can reproduce this, and MRI did that. And over the last 15 to 20 years, that technology has massively improved. Um, in terms of magnets, in terms of what we can use in terms of sequences. So we'll look at the same area, almost like mathematics. Um, I used to love maths and kind of simultaneous equations. So we'll look at the same area with different sequences to work out what's going on. And this is a classic T1 weighted image that shows fat as bone marrow in the fat you can see there and you can see fat in the subcutaneous tissues not very much because this is an athlete and the muscle is sort of intermediate and then the gristle and the tendons are all low signal and the problem with this is that it shows us anatomy really nicely but any insult to tissue be it sports injury be it any form of trauma be it infection be it uh, a cancer the cells are usually damaged and leak out fluid and we want to see that as fluid but fluid on T1 weighted images is relatively low so actually the injury is here but you'd be very difficult to see it so therefore we the same area we perform a T2 fat suppressed so now you can see that the marrow and the subcutaneous fat has gone black the muscle hasn't really changed and we've now got this area um, down here, which is the muscle that's damaged. So it's swollen, it's got fluid in it, it's got a tear in it that's allowing fluid to leak out. And in the same athlete, we can see that with ultrasound. So again, we can see the um, tear in this area and uh, the kind of hole in it, but you can see that that high definition only goes for a couple of centimetres. And therefore, to assess the whole thigh or to assess a larger region, you need MRI, and ultrasound has a much more focal role. So apart from soft tissues, we also need to be able to see joints because less than 5% of all sports injuries are actually bony related. And, uh, and a lot of those bone changes are actually in joints that we can't see on x-rays. So if we have our uh, humerus and our kind of shoulder region. We want to be able to see those bones, we want to be able to see the cartilage, the ligaments that go around them, as well as the muscles. And again, MRI gives us that opportunity to see all of those tissues in any plane that we want. So, in the sequence you see on the left, again, is fat suppressed, and it allows us to see the fluid. I'm sorry the mouse doesn't seem to be um, working on this, so I can't point at things, but I don't need to, luckily. Um, the uh, bones you can see, and we can also image it in any plane. And this image on the right 
we've actually injected fluid into it. So if there isn't enough fluid there for us to see things, we can also inject fluid and create what's called an arthrogram and see the structures in really fine detail. Ultrasound has a big advantage in that uh, if the structure is visible on ultrasound, it's seen to a very high definition, but also movement doesn't degrade the image at all. Whereas if you move when you're having your MRI, the images become degraded. So with the shoulder, for example, we can see tendons and we can get the patient to move. So if you want to look at that tendon at the top, we put our probe on, we send in the sound waves and we get an image like this. And we can actually get the patient to move and see the tendon moving underneath the bone. The other massive advantage for ultrasound, of course, is that we can see uh, our needle as it comes in and we can direct treatment uh, or diagnostic injections into areas. And diagnostically, we can inject anaesthetic to see if that takes away symptoms. And in the past, treatment has largely been based on steroid as a, as a painkiller. But in recent years, we're developing more and new techniques to actually treat the underlying condition. Rather than just being a painkiller, we're trying to promote repair. And one of those is fenestration, which is just a fancy word for we absolutely pepper a tendon with the needle to make it bleed and help the repair process. But we'll talk about that more later. So in terms of sports imaging, nearly all the, the injuries we want to see are predominantly involved in the soft tissues. And in acute injuries, muscle and tendon form over 50% um, of all the injuries. And even when joints are involved, it's the soft tissues, the ligaments, the cartilage and, and, and capsule around them that are affected. When we move on to the right, where we have more overuse problems, again, joints are affected and tendons are affected. And the majority of sports, the lower limb is, is the most predominantly affected uh, uh, area because of running and the activity. But of course, shoulder, uh, certainly in rugby, is commonly affected in certain athletics and the wrist in golf, we see a lot of injury. So what are our take home points so far? Well, radiology, all aspects of radiology have benefited from a massive increase in medical technology. And that's happened since I've been a consultant in the last 20 years. And in fact, those advances have often outstripped our ability to clinically evaluate them and rigorously evaluate them with research. Sports imaging requires high definition of bone and soft tissues, and therefore we depend mainly on MRI, but we also use ultrasound in specialist areas and for intervention. So as Andrea already alluded to, um, there's a sports medicine team or a team of, of professionals that are involved in sports imaging. And that really took off in the 1990s and 2000s with the kind of money deal uh, for television. So it affected football, affected rugby and predominantly cricket. And that money enabled teams to have a better medical service behind them, which uh, influenced what was done in terms of sports imaging. What also happened in, uh, during the 2000s uh, was uh, we got awarded the London Olympics. And although they took place in 2012, the investment by the government into sport in the decade beforehand was enormous from the uh, lottery. And therefore, suddenly sports that didn't have access to that TV money in the past suddenly had access to it. It was all Olympic sports, all Paralympic sports. Um, so athletics, boxing, table tennis suddenly had a medical infrastructure to promote good health and ultimately performance. So in the Olympics, uh, we were based in the Athletes Village, which was good fun. And we had a, a medical building, which after the Olympics became a, a community health centre. And you can see on the left, the MRI scanner getting delivered. And we ended up with a, an MRI scanner and a CT scanner just sitting outside. But inside, we had a radiology department with ultrasound, with um, x-rays. We also had sports medicine doctors. We had orthopaedic surgeons. They had a really good uh, team working uh, ethic and it really has shaped sports medicine in the UK uh, in that time. During that time, also sports and exercise medicine was granted its own college and became a recognised specialty. And you can see, as I've already said, in the pie chart at the bottom, the majority of imaging still was MRI and ultrasound uh, with a few x-rays. 
So when we look at the medical team, Andrew's already alluded to this, we've obviously got the patient or the athlete at the centre. And certainly in the UK, the physiotherapist is often the coordinator for most care for the athlete. So the physiotherapist to the football team, to the rugby team, um, to the cricket team, often sees the athlete every day, monitors minor injuries, and if those injuries progress, they then can call on further uh, help. And usually it's in terms of the sports medicine doctor and imaging is usually performed pretty early on. There's lots of other specialties and lots of other coaches who all believe they have equally important roles and uh, that's the way we go. So what's the problem with this? Well, we're a young specialty in terms of sports and exercise medicine is definitely young. Sports imaging is, is relatively young in terms of what happens and so we can get carried away. And there's a such thing as called the hype cycle. And it's not as negative as it initially sounds. So this is Gardner's hype cycle and you can see that there's initially an innovation trigger that stimulates a lot of acti activity and then we all get a bit disillusioned and then we plateau out to where perhaps it should be. An example of this, and I don't know if any of you have heard of it, is uh, impingement of the hip or FAI. And this was a condition that kind of nicely illustrates this sort of hype cycle. So what was the innovation? Well, the first innovation was the uh, group from uh, 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 in Switzerland in 2002 described this condition of femoroacetabular impingement. And we're looking down here on top of the hip joint. So on, you've got the uh, socket and you've got the ball of the thigh bone fitting in. And the, one, the image on the right shows this kind of prominence. Again, I can't point at it. Oh, I've got my mouse smirking. There you go. Um, there's the prominence, which shouldn't be there. And then as you move your hip, it impacts and you create damage within the hip. So this was a new diagnosis and was used uh, to really characterise a lot of hip and groin pain in many athletes. This was kind of the answer to what had been happening and we hadn't known it. And the good thing was you could even see it on x-ray. Again, you can see the prominence, so you could diagnose it easily on x-ray. And then the other innovation they came up with, unlike hip replacement surgery, where it doesn't really matter about the femoral head because you throw it in the bin and you put your replacement in, to, die, to kind of disarticulate the hip and have a good look around the joint was really difficult without compromising the hip joint, but they devised a technique that could be safely done. So all of a sudden you had this new hip diagnosis and then you had this new innovation in surgery that allowed it to be treated. And this is an open operation where the uh, femoral head bump is chipped off. And they quickly were able to do this arthroscopically, which previously we had a lot of shoulder arthroscopy and knee arthroscopy because they're relatively big joints that are capacious. It was really difficult to do hip arthroscopy. So it came from nowhere that suddenly we could do all this. And if you look um, over the next 10 to 15 years, the incidence of hip arthroscopy in the UK, and just remember, this is relatively minor compared to what happened in the United States. And then the publications that occurred for FAI with a dip beginning in 2015. And why did that dip occur? Well, we began to realize with larger studies and wider populations that in fact, if we x-rayed 100 people in the room, 20 of them would have this abnormality that never have any symptoms. So there began to be doubt that this was a self-fulfilling prophecy and that you would always get osteoarthritis. And the condition began to be refined in that there had to be specific clinical conditions and research showed this. So all of a sudden, we began to realize that it wasn't the answer to everything. We went to the trough of, dis uh, trough of disillusionment, but then we began to be enlightened from the research about which patients or athletes needed to be treated. And I said at the beginning, this isn't all negative because we've got divide huge benefits from this burst of activity. So we didn't have safe open hip surgery or even hip arthroscopy really at the beginning of this process. But now we do. We can use it across all of medicine in all patients. Imaging was similarly really difficult because even if we injected dye, we couldn't see things really clearly. Um, but now we can perform non-orthographic uh, imaging of the hip and see the cartilage and the labrum and all the detail we need to know. But also we now know what is normal, both for a, a patient 
and who's a non-athlete and an athlete so we can reassure people we can give them better information and avoid unnecessary surgery and sports and exercise medicine research has caught up and shown that really this condition in terms of symptoms can be largely prevented through strengthening exercises rather than the need to jump to surgery as used to be the case. So let's kind of finish off in terms of imaging with muscle injury because this is the most common cause for requests. It's the commonest injury that occurs in sports, professional sports, and it's always imaged to see the extent of injury. And as I've said, we've got this fantastic technology that we can see things. So if we follow a muscle in, uh, down to its uh, insertion with the tendon, we can see that on imaging. And here's the tear and the tendon's torn uh, and retracted almost like a spring up into the thigh. So we can see these injuries in real detail and even better than we could before. So of course, it must be, you know, we must be able to predict what happens. The problem is when you look at it, and this is one system that we use for grading, and I'll just get you to focus on this line here. This is return to play. And you can see with the severer injury, where there's that, like the image I just showed you, um, where there's a complete tear, the player can be out for 73 days, and plus or minus 60, which doesn't really help, because that means they could be out for 13 days, or they could be out for 100 and something days. But as soon as you move to the left and look at those lower grades, you can immediately see there isn't a lot of difference in return to play. So, yes, we can make the diagnosis, but can we tell the athlete, the team, how long they're going to be out? So it looks like if it's a severe injury, we sort of can, but for every other injury below that, which is the most frequent, we can't. So then this new system came along, the British Athletics Muscle Injury Classification Grade, and they tried, as you can see on the left, to have three areas within it. Muscle, myotendinous junction, which is the commonest area, or a purely tendon involvement or a combination of them all. With the, with the theory that the bigger the tendon involvement, the more severe the injury. But you can see with this graph, again, on the right, the severer injury, we're up at 80 days to return. But to the left, all those other dots with their standard deviation actually overlap. So again, we're not really predicting it that well. Then if you look at the biology of muscle healing, when you go through all the phases from inflammation to remodeling and all the various cell uh, re reformation, you can see that we're over on the right, we're at 100 days, but in fact, most injuries, as you saw, are around the 20 days. So if we were biologically waiting for the muscle to completely heal, no player would go back until 100 days, but we've just seen most of them go back less than 20. Then if you look at tendon healing, it gets worse because it can be many months before a tendon is biologically back to relative normality. So what does that mean? Well, it means, well, we don't have to wait for that to happen. Players and athletes can return to play before biologically everything's healed. So there's many more variables. It depends on the severity of injury. Yes, it does. We saw that with this really severe injury, it was longer, but the lower grades is not so important. The sport, you know, whether you're a 100 meter runner or you're uh, a back in rugby, will vary in terms of what stress your muscles will go through and how much repair is needed before you can perform to your uh, full potential. And even within the same sport, you have different positions. The athlete is really important because we have some athletes that can accept they've got an injury and are keen to get back. Other athletes, every time they run, if they feel a slight twinge, they're kind of thinking, well, I'm going to have this injury again. But also some athletes seem to repair really, really quickly with the same injury as another uh, athlete. And this could be genetics. If they have other injuries, such as a knee injury or a hip injury, they're obviously not going to return to play as quickly uh, as a player that doesn't. And unfortunately, it can relate to your age, but also it can relate to timing in terms of your career, in terms of the season. Is there a World Cup final coming up or is it just the end of the season and you don't have to get back to play? And I think going forward, um, all these variables we have to think of because the player or the athlete wants to get back to performance. But we've also got to look at their health. 
And as Andrew alluded to, there's mental health and there's physical health. And at the moment, everything's focused on getting the player back to playing, but are there physical long-term effects? And sometimes this we just don't know. And really, this is where research may have to go. So I'll briefly men mention intervention. I've talked about steroid injection. And really, what's changed in the last few years is that we've introduced newer techniques and we've actually replaced surgical procedures in a lot of athletes. So an example of this is your Achilles tendon. And you can have the arrows pointing at inflammation beside the Achilles tendon, but the tendon itself is normal. And this used to be treated by a surgical operation where they cleared it out and flushed it. But we now perform that radiologically. So on the left, you can see the needle moving into that kind of black area of fluid. And then we over distend it with local anaesthetic and it breaks up the adhesions. You can see the, the air bubbles going in with the fluid. And then there's a little bit of tissue there that I'm having to break up. And this now has completely replaced surgery, so they've been out for at least two to three weeks with a surgical procedure, and most athletes get back within less than seven to ten days. And also, obviously there's a lot less morbidity associated with this with compared to surgery. The current trend in sports imaging is injecting blood products. And I talked about fenestration, where we make a tendon bleed or make soft tissues bleed, and the reason why that is thought to be a good thing to do is that it stimulates local cell response in terms of fibroblasts and growth factors. So people took that further and they said, well, let's inject some blood into the injury rather than just make it bleed locally, let's get some extra blood into. They took blood from a patient or an athlete and injected it into the area. Then they thought, well, hold on, we don't want all the blood, we just want the good bit of the blood. And therefore, now they're focusing on getting the growth factors uh, in, the, in, in a higher concentration. So you may have heard of PRP, or platelet-rich plasma, and that is an effort to try and concentrate those growth factors and cytokines. So we take blood from the patient, we um, spin it in a centrifuge in a special tube like this that separates out the blood. So these, ke these uh, chemicals down here bind the, the blood cells and we're left with the plasma with the relatively rich cytokines, which we can then draw off and inject. Um, and this is what is done currently in a lot of professional sports, but we don't have proof that it's better than not doing it or giving somebody a, a blind injection. And that's the problem in professional sport. What professional athletes going to consent to a randomized controlled trial where they get no treatment as opposed to a treatment that everybody else has been telling them is the latest thing and it needs doing. And therefore, a lot of studies are actually done in amateurs and sometimes that isn't translatable. So let's look at the future. And uh, certainly in terms of intervention, uh, injections, we may already are looking at stem cells. So instead of injecting all these growth factors to try and stimulate stem cells, people are looking at growing uh, stem cells to inject into injured tendons and to in inject into muscle. And we can also try and further emulate uh, minor surgical procedures. And again, new technology is being developed. And on the left, you can see a needle, because most of our needles, I hope you can anyway, are straight. And that's kind of a limitation that we can't go around things. And this is a new needle that's been developed in America where you can actually rotate it around and alter its position, and you can see it going around the bone to reach its target. Another area where um, surgery um, is being performed in inverted commas in is in terms of release. And release is just a fancy surgical term for cutting something. So if something is inflamed and uh, is causing problems and isn't vital to function, quite often they'll go in and release it, as in cut it. So it can happen to people with plantar fasciitis, and it can occur with a small tendon that um, goes beside the Achilles tendon called plantaris. And this is from one of my colleagues, uh, Dr. Justin Lee, who's been experimenting in terms of using the instrument on the left. And here it is on the right in action. So we've come through the skin using ultrasound with this procedure. And the hook goes to the plantaris tendon. And this is the Achilles tendon. And 
he's able to cut it. And again, it need, doesn't need a surgical operation. But at the beginning of this talk, I sort of dismissed um, CT a bit. But we use CT a lot in terms of when we do have bone injuries. But CT is now catching up with the other modalities in what it can do. And on the right, you can see there's somebody standing. So we can now do weight-bearing uh, CT, which again gives you nice uh, uh, images of what happens to the, a joint in weight-bearing. And on the left here, I'll just play the video. This is a ankle that's been obtained with the patient static, not moving, but the software allows you to start moving it as though it's moving. And therefore, you can start windowing. As you can see here, the windowed and the tendons start to appear. This is the Achilles tendon here. And we can keep moving the joint and seeing what happens to those tendons and what happens to those bones and see if they impinge. So this isn't the patient moving, this is all kind of virtual. And you can start to remove bones and see what happens to other bones with that bone removed. And so this is a very exciting way to do this. And it's something that may be able to do with MRI in the future, but at the moment CT is certainly superior for this type of uh, process. And another advance generally in imaging, in terms of certainly in oncology and all aspects of radiology, is looking for imaging biomarkers. And that's a fancy term really to say, is there something we can find on imaging that is a marker of disease or is a marker of outcome? And the beginning of this talk, when I talk about the past and the present, we're looking at structural abnormalities on imaging. But imaging is now progressing that we can see different things. We can see chemicals in, uh, in muscles. We can see how stiff tissues are um, in terms of experimenting. And this is an example of MRI in an injured muscle where we're looking at stiffness, which is called elastography, the elasticity of it. And we can do that with ultrasound really well as well. But we can also map structures. And this is cartilage mapping. So in the past and present, when I'm looking for cartilage damage, I have to look for a hole in this cartilage to say a bit of cartilage is gone. Whereas I can look at this is all intact, so if I was to do a normal MRI, this would look completely normal. But we can do mapping to look at chem chemicals in the cartilage that are predicting where the damage will, is occurring, but it hasn't actually occurred yet. So this is very exciting, but is still all very experimental. And this is a study we're doing in Leeds, where uh, visit one and visit two, those two images, are an athlete with an acute tear, and then visit two is when the team have now decided clinically that he's able, to, or she, is able to come back to play. And at that point, we re-image them, and we perform what's called diffusion, where we can see how the cells are moving, which I think is kind of very grainy images at the bottom. They're not, not because the image isn't very good quality. That's just the, the kind of quality you get. And you can measure factors to see if any of those factors predict play better than me just grading it. But again, that is research. So in conclusion, sports imaging plays a crucial role in sports medicine and athlete performance. Um, in the last 20 years, the imaging has rapidly advanced in both in terms of diagnosis and intervention. But you have to know what's expected with athletes and that's had a, a massive, uh, I mean, one of the most massive impacts that we've had. We've learnt that certain things we th thought were path pathological were actually normal in athletes. And this has been extrapolated to the NHS and the population, as has our diagnosis and intervention uh, techniques I've shown you. There's little data still on looking at a structural abnormality, how that affects prognosis precisely. And that is something where we're going to have to focus on in our next area of research. Can we predict things better? And eventually, will we be able to be, give a better predictor of morbidity from these injuries as a duty of care to athletes? Thank you.